if you join me in 1 Peter chapter 2 this morning, we will be studying verses 4 to 10, but we're going to begin reading in verse 1, just to understand the flow of the passage. We'll be preaching this morning from verses 4 to 10 on the theme of a holy community. Apostle Paul writing to believers in the dispersion. They've been dispersed from Jerusalem for a long time. They've probably planted churches. And he writes to encourage them as they undergo some suffering, some persecution, which we'll read about later on in the book. He wants to encourage them that they are indeed a holy communion. They need to have a holy conduct and be a holy community. And he writes in verse 1, chapter 2, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn babes, long for a crave for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted, if indeed you have experienced that the Lord is good, that the Lord is gracious. As you come to Him, literally as you are coming to Him, a living stone, Rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture. Some translations say, for the Scripture says. But I love this, for it stands in Scripture. It's irrefutable. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. And here's the word of contrast, but you, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possessions, possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. That's a great statement, isn't it? Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. That's your identity. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Well, when God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, Jesus did what he told Peter and the other disciples what he would do. He began to build his church. Remember, he said to Peter upon Peter's confession, of faith, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Jesus Christ is building the new covenant church, what Paul referred to in Galatians 6, 16 as the Israel of God. And Peter in our text refers to this as the, the house of God, a house being built by God's Spirit, as Anton reminded us. The local church is God's chosen people that displays a holy conduct as Tommy taught us in chapter 1, verses 1 to 21. Last week we saw that the church is to be growing as a holy communion with one another and with the Lord. We saw that in chapter 1, verses 22 down to verse 3 of chapter 2. And this morning we look at verses 4 to 10 where Peter reminds the church that they are a holy community. To make this clear, Peter uses several descriptive phrases grounded in the Old Testament in order to remind this church, these believers rather, who were scattered around in various churches, of their identity. Because Peter understands that if this, these believers will live properly as a community of faith, then they must appreciate the amazing identity that is given to them by God. This matter of identity is crucial, crucial for holy living. You're never going to do verses 1 to 21 of chapter 1 unless you understand your identity that God has appointed to us in Christ. There's much talk today about identity, 
But the concept has been largely corrupted. One's identity, whether it be gender or even ethnic, is no longer considered something that's fixed at birth. It's something that flows according to a person's feelings. Not only is that nonsense, it leads to complete non-flourishing of life. Because you cannot live based on a lie. But I want to suggest to you that when it comes to the Christian, the same is true. That we can't live by our feelings. We have to live by our fixed identity that God has given to us at our new birth. At our new birth, we become the people of God. We're joined to the Israel of God. We're joined to the new covenant church. And when the believer, when the local church fails to embrace its identity as God's holy community, as God's Israel, then she too will fail to flourish as God intends. I would suggest to you that if we do not understand our biblically prescribed identity that God has given to us in Christ, then we will fail to embrace our God-destined um, potential. If we lose sight of our place in God's redemptive history, if we lose sight of our purpose in God's redemptive history, which goes with our identity, then we will lose sight of our potential in God's redemptive history. And I'm going to bring that to ahead at the end of the sermon. While this, these believers are being persecuted and afflicted, they need to remember their identity, and as they do, they will live as flourishing Christians, as flourishing local churches, even though they are scattered abroad. I want us to address this passage in three headings. We're going to look at a community that is drawing near to God. We're going to look at a community that is building up by God. We're going to look at a community that is speaking out for God. First of all, verse 4, a community that is drawing near. Look with me in verse 4. Peter writes, As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Now, just pause here for a moment. When Peter writes this phrase, as you come to him, and we're going to see in this passage this morning that he's just, Peter's just been meditating on the Old Testament. He quotes from Isaiah, I think at least three times. He quotes from Psalm 118. He's going to quote from Hosea chapter 1 and Hosea chapter 2. And as he's thinking about the Old Testament, he has his Old Testament imagery in his mind. And so when he says to him, as you come to him, that's actually a phrase in the Old Testament that had to do with drawing near to God as a priest. In fact, in Leviticus chapter 9 and verse 7, uh, we read where Moses commands Aaron and his sons to draw near to the tabernacle. In Numbers chapter 16 and verse 40, um, again, there is a commandment for the priest to draw near to God in the tabernacle. This phrase, come to him, uh, or draw near to him, is found again in Hebrews Chapter 4 and verse 16, where we're encouraged to draw near to the throne of grace. We're told in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, and in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22, that through Jesus Christ, we are able to draw near to God. He has just said in verse 3, if indeed you have tasted the Lord is good, if indeed you have experienced the grace of the Lord, and now he's assuming in verse 4 that we continue to do that. In fact, in the original, this is a present tense. So he's saying, as you are coming to him, as you are drawing near to him, a living stone. Whatever else he's going to say in these verses is intimately connected to the fact that these believers he's expecting are always coming near to Christ. That they are drawing near to him, the living stone. When Peter wrote these words, no doubt he had on his mind not only Psalm 118, but he had on his mind the words of Jesus, who in Matthew 21 gives a parable to the Pharisees who were opposing him. They were actually stumbling over him. And Jesus gives that parable of the, of the tenants, that there was a landowner and he gave a, a vineyard into the care of tenants. 
And then he sent his servants, and the tenants killed the servants. And then the landowner said, you know what, surely they will honor my son. And so he sends his son. And what do the, the tenants do? They kill the son. Well, Jesus in that parable quotes or says, says them, quotes from Psalm 118, verse 22, that he is the living stone. As you come to him, the living stone, he's alive, and he's alive because of the resurrection, though he's rejected by men, but in the sight of God, he's chosen and precious. What Peter is saying is that this new holy community is a community that is constantly coming to Jesus Christ, which, by the way, he's made very clear in verse 3, is God. The holy community is a community that draws near to God in, in Christ in worship. They draw near to him because they see him as precious. They see him as honorable, as we'll see later on in the passage. Those who do not believe in Christ, they yawn at Christ. They do not see him as precious. They do not see him as honorable. I, I'm not a terribly emotional person, but as we were singing today um, that, that song, All Creatures of Our God and King, and it talked about bless the, the, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, it just grabbed my heart that the preciousness of our God, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is honorable. Well, what Peter's assuming is if you are in Christ, you are constantly drawing near him in worship. There's a couple of things to be said about this. As the entire context of verses 4 and 10 makes clear, Peter's not thinking here individualist, individualistically. He's not aiming this letter primarily at the individuals. He is aiming it at the, the different bodies of Christ that are gathered in this scattered region throughout Turkey, he's writing to these congregations and he's saying as a congregation, as you are coming near to him. Yes, we do draw near to Christ as individuals in worship, but we think too much individualistically. That actually what Peter is exhorting here is that as a, spirit, as a spiritual household, we are coming to him, which certainly includes a day like today, right? In fact, it's interesting when he quotes Psalm 118 down in verse 7. The stone that the builders rejected has become a, the cornerstone. When you look at those words in the context of Psalm 118, he speaks about this living stone, Christ, Messiah, who was rejected by men, but believed on by those who God chose, that he is this precious living stone. And then he says in verse 24, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. It's not just any day. It's the day of Christ's resurrection in the context there. And so this, the Lord's day, is the day let us rejoice and be glad in it. If we were anywhere else, we'd be rejoicing, right? <laughs> Except for a Baptist church. The fact of the matter is, we draw near as a body of Christ. To do that, I would assume we need to be doing that during the week, individually. But as we gather, we draw near, we come near to him. But here's the most important thing. How is it we draw near to him? What does he mean when Peter says, as you are coming to him? I want to suggest to you down in verse 6 when he quotes from Isaiah 28, 16. The last part of that, he says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Then in verse 7, so the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe. The way that we come to Christ is actually very simple. We come to Christ believing in him. We can, what he's saying is, as you are continually believing on Christ, as you are continually Repenting and trusting him. As you are continually looking to Christ and believing on this living stone, this is our assignment, is continual belief in him. We draw near to him. The expectation of the community, of 
of faith, of God's holy community. The expectation is that we are coming to him, even though he's been rejected by men. We know in the sight of God he's chosen and precious, but that brings us to the next thing. What does coming to Christ, what does continually believing in him, what does drawing near to him result in? It results in a community that is building up. He says in verse 5, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Don't miss the connection. The present tense, verse 4, as you are continually coming to him, as you are continually drawing near to Christ, as you are continually worshiping him, as you are continually believing in him, what happens is... You are being built up. It's not an imperative. It is not a command. Peter's not saying to these believers in these churches, build yourself up. What he's saying is, here's how you are built up, by drawing near to Christ. It's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, when it says that I planted, Apollos watered, but God gives the growth. It is God who is building us up, but he builds us up as we, as a corporate body, as we, as a holy community, are continually drawing near to Christ. Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. He didn't say, you will build my church. He said, I will build my church. How does he do that? He does that by you and I properly worshiping him. By you and I coming to him, constantly believing on him, worshiping him, drawing near to him through the gospel. As we do that, the church is being built up. Again, as we corporately do this, the church is built up and it's built up into a spiritual house. He doesn't mean by this that it's something that is non-material. What he means is it's a house that is built up, as we heard in the Catechism, by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God builds up the church to be a holy priesthood. What do the priests do? Well, the priests offer. In fact, the phrase to offer literally means to bring to the altar. They bring to the altar spiritual sacrifices that are accepted by God through Jesus Christ. What did the priesthood do in the Old Testament? They drew near to God by coming to the tabernacle and people would bring sacrifices and the priest would offer those up. They'd bring those to the altar and, and, and they needed to be without blemish and they needed to be acceptable. And as they were, then the worship was accepted. What he's saying here in the new covenant is we are a, a different kind of house. We're not a, again, I didn't ask Anton to do this, but just the way he introduced the service today. This is not the church building. If this church building collapses, and it's not, the roof was fixed. If this building were to collapse this afternoon, we would still be the same spiritual house of Brackenhurst Baptist Church. Now, it's nice to have a building. I'm not lamenting that. But we're a spiritual house. We're no longer a geographic place you had to go to like Old Covenant Israel. The new Israel, the true Israel, the new covenant Israel is God's spiritual house and it's filled with a priesthood. Every one of us who's a believer, the priesthood of the believer. Every one of us is called to offer up spiritual sacrifices. What does that mean? Well, Paul perhaps illustrates it in Hebrews 12 when he speaks about, I therefore, in light of the mercies of God, I beg you, I urge you, I beseech you, to offer up your bodies as living sacrifices. Hebrews 13 speaks about offering up, I think in verse 10, offering up the sacrifices of praise. He then speaks just after that about offering up our possessions to meet the needs of one another. We, our spiritual sacrifices are our, 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 our persons and our praises and our possessions and, and all of that. And that all happens not by force. I was talking to someone who's been started coming to our church during lockdown and had dinner with him a couple of weeks ago. And he said to me, he said, you know, I, I came to the church week after week and I kept waiting for you to ask for money. 
because that's what he was used to. And he was surprised that we didn't talk about money. Well, and the reason we don't do that, unless it's in the text, we're probably not going to talk much about it. But what's interesting is, as a church is drawing near to God in worship, you don't have to talk a lot about money. Because as people understand who God is, as people love the Lord Jesus Christ, they're willing to let go of their possessions. I mean, our church is, is, has never been in a healthier position in so many ways than it has been the past seven months. And I've been gone most of that time, which is humbling. <laughs> I can leave again, all right? <laughs> Hopefully in a more pleasant way. But I was thinking about that this week. The church has, has been built up. Why? Because you have been coming near. You've been drawing near. You've been believing. You've been worshiping God. And the result of that is God is building his church. I'm going to be here next week regardless of that, but <laughs> thank God for that. As the church is fed the word of God, and it's so essential, the word of God be proclaimed. Everything we do in our services are planned around the word of God, whether it's the call to worship, whether it's the opening prayer, whether it's the pastoral prayer, whether it's the preaching, whether it's the singing, it's all grounded in God's word. It's by God's word that we draw near to him because by God's word we learn to believe more on him. I was reading this week again, William Still, who was a Scottish pastor, pastor of a church in Edinburgh for 52 years. He just died a few years ago. He wrote a book called The Work of a Pastor, a little book, but every pastor I know has read that book. And he has a chapter there, or a section there, where he really exhorts ministers to preach God's word. And he says this, he says, it is to feed the sheep on biblical truth that men are called to churches in congregations, whatever they may think they are called to do. If you think, he writes to ministers, if you think that you are called to keep a largely worldly organization miscalled a church, going with all kinds of doses of innocuous sub-Christian drugs or stimulants, then the only help I can give you is to advise you to give up the hope of the ministry and go and be a street scavenger. A far healthier and more godly job keeping the streets tidy than, than it is cluttering the church with a lot of worldly claptrap in the delusion that you're doing a job for God. The pastor is called to feed the sheep, even if the sheep do not want to be fed. He is certainly not to become an entertainer of goats. Let goats entertain goats and let them do it out in goat land. You will certainly not turn goats into sheep by pandering to their goatishness. Do we really believe that the word of God by his spirit changes as well as maddens men? If we do, to be evangelists and pastors, feeders of sheep, we must be men of the word of God. And that's just another way of saying what Peter is saying. That as we are coming to the living stone, as we are coming, and, and, and again, he's just steeped in scripture. Everything just oozes from this book, from, from, from the Old Testament, in, in this passage. As we feed the word of God to the church, it is built up. And the church wants to gather. I remember years ago, a man said to me one morning, he said, Pastor, he said, you feed me so well that I, that I only need to come to church once a week. <laughs> Apparently one week I fed him so well, he hasn't been back since. That is nonsense. Because, as we saw last week, we are to be constantly longing for the spiritual milk of the Word. We constantly need God's Word. We need more than one meal. We need several. It's a church that is being built up as we draw near to Him. And again, as a priesthood of believers, it's a 
And, and again, it's not individualistically. He's saying all of us. As all of us as priests are doing what we're supposed to be doing, this is how God builds up his church. He goes on, and he confirms this with Scripture. He says in verse 6, For it stands in Scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. He's quoting here from Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 16. And in the context, Isaiah's writing is saying, listen, you're going to be sur surrounded by those who are controlled by fear of the enemy. You are going to be surrounded by those who are rejecting the messianic promise. But he says, if you believe on him, if you believe on this cornerstone, this living stone, as Peter calls him, then as you believe on him, you will not be put to shame. But you will not be disappointed. God is building up a church through people who are drawing near to him. And the more we draw near to him, the more we realize that this precious cornerstone is chosen. He is precious. He is honorable. And therefore, as we trust him, as we continue to believe in him, we will not be disappointed. It goes on in verse 7. So the honor is for you who believe... But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Here he's quoting from Psalm 118, verse 22. Then in verse 8, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Now he's quoting from Isaiah 8, 14. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Peter's writing this for a couple of reasons. He's saying to them, not everybody is going to appreciate this spiritual house. And not everybody's going to appreciate the fact that you are a living stone, which just as, a, a, as an aside, an important aside, he calls them, he calls Christ the living stone, and then we also as lively stones. It's a beautiful way of him saying, you know what? You who find Christ as precious and as honorable, God finds you precious and honorable. But he says not everyone's going to appreciate that. And so there's going to be those who reject. But he's trying to remind them that this spiritual house is immovable. It is indestructible because it is built upon the cornerstone. The cornerstone in the ancient world was a massive, like an angular stone at the, at the, at the corner of a building's foundation. In fact, what I read this week was they, were, they, they could weigh several tons and be several meters wide and high. And so this is something that is, that is huge. Jesus Christ was, was a boulder, as it were, and yet people stumbled over him. Several weeks ago, a brother in the church sent me a message and said, listen, can we meet at replay and just go for a walk? And so um, we... I met him there at Reflay, and we started on a walk just to fellowship. And uh, we were walking those nice, smooth paths there in Reflay. And then all of a sudden, he said, let's do these, this bike path. And this bike path was like, there's different degrees of bike paths, right? What's the worst color? What is it? It's black. He said, Here's the black, let's do the black path. And then, by the way, the next day I was having surgery, and so I'm thinking, is this really smart? But I, I wouldn't mention Ryan Butterworth's name, but he said, let's do this, okay? <laughs> so we're walking, and I find myself tripping over a lot of these, you know, unseen rocks. There were several boulders there. I had no problem recognizing a boulder. I didn't trip over that. But I tripped over these little stones. And I think what, what is interesting for us to take away from this is that Jesus Christ was a boulder. You couldn't miss him. The Pharisees, the elders, they couldn't miss him. But they did. It's as though God was saying, here he is. God wasn't trying to hide Messiah. Here he is. Here's the Savior, and I want to say to you today, you are not saved. Here he is. He's here in these scriptures. He's not hiding. You don't need to stumble over him. 
Repent and believe on him and become a living stone. Those who didn't see his glory, they didn't see his preciousness, his honor, they stumble over him. But those who are the living stones, those who are being built up in the faith, those who are being built up in this the spiritual house are those who by God's grace have seen, seen his glory. He says here in verse 8, they stumbled, the end of verse 8, they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Destined to do. That makes people very uncomfortable. People who have a real discomfort with the doctrine of God's predestination. Because fundamentally, when we were, and I remember stumbling over this myself for years and arguing against it, but fundamentally I had to come to the conclusion my biggest problem is I'm just not letting God be God. They were destined to. When you read in Acts 2, when Peter preaches the day of Pentecost, and he says, he said, you know, Jesus Christ, his, his death, his crucifixion that you're guilty of, he was destined for that. God works the, with the evil human responsibility and propensity to fulfill his sovereign will. But I do want to say this. I have to be very, very careful about this in verse 8, as they were destined to do, is not making a statement here about their ultimate outcome. In other words... Someone who is presently not believing, yes, they are destined right now not to believe, but because they don't believe tomorrow doesn't mean they won't, today doesn't mean they won't believe tomorrow. Keep praying. Keep preaching. Keep pleading with people. Keep persuading people from the gospel because you have no idea what the outcome is. Well, the Holy Community is one that draws near to God, it's one that is being built up by God, and finally, it is one that is speaking out for God. He says in verse 9, but you are, and he uses, again, now he's quoting from Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him. That is from Isaiah 43, 21. Do you see where Peter knows his Bible? And he's grounding everything he says here in Scripture. You may proclaim, declare, you can translate it, you can translate it, celebrate the excellencies, the virtue, the moral goodness of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Those are terms right out of the book of Isaiah. Verse 10, he quotes from Isaiah, Hosea 1, Hosea 2. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. Peter brings this to a conclusion by, say, by saying, in light of who God has chosen you to be, in light of your identity, you have responsibility to speak out for him. To proclaim his excellencies, which was Isaiah 43, 21, Israel's original purpose. Israel was chosen by God to be his people with a unique identity as the children, the people of God. And the responsibility was, as they went through uh, the, 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 out of Egypt, through the wilderness and into the promised land, they were to be proclaiming God's excellencies. They were to be celebrating who he is. They were to be manifesting his glory to the pagans surrounding them. Peter says, now, this is now our assignment. And again, he lifts verse 9 right out of Exodus 19, 5 and 6. And it's important to understand that in Exodus chapter 19, just a few chapters earlier, God has brought the nation of Israel out of, out of Egypt, right? And now they're on Sinai. And God calls Moses up to the mount, and he says, listen, he gives him an if-then statement. If Israel will do this, then I will make them, and he uses these words, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession. Which, by the way, is a quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6. 
And just before he gives the law, and just before he gives instruction to Moses about the children of Israel, he says, this is their identity, and this is what they're supposed to do. Well, Peter says that's exactly what we're supposed to be doing now because we're the chosen people. We're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation, a people for his own possession. You could translate that, his own precious possession. And we are to declare his goodness. We are to declare his grace. We are to declare his moral virtue. In other words, and all that is summed up in the gospel. What is the best way for us to present God to a lost world? The best way is to proclaim the gospel of the grace of God. Because in the gospel, you have God's justice. You have God's love. You have God's wrath. You have God's mercy. You have God's grace. You have God's wisdom. As we proclaim the gospel, the good news of what God has done through his son who lived a perfect life For those he came to die for. As we proclaim the good news that Jesus Christ died for sinners. And experienced God's wrath in their place. As we proclaim the good news that he rose from the dead. And he is the living stone. By doing so we were saying look at our great God. This church that draws near. Doesn't just draw near for a holy huddle. It draws near to worship God in Christ. It draws near to be strengthened, to go out into a world that is hostile to the gospel and say, look at our great God, hear the gospel. The Apostle Paul could not have been Sorry, Peter could not have been Paul too, but Paul Peter here could not have been any clearer using this terminology than the saying, "Hey, New Covenant Church, hey, those of you who are scattered abroad, you are the Israel of God. You are the people of God. You are the New Covenant." Israel, you are the fulfillment of all those promises. You know, this position I'm preaching, is people oftentimes sneer at and they say, well, you believe in replacement theology. You believe the church replaced Israel. I don't believe the church replaced Israel. I believe that in the church, the promises to Israel are all fulfilled gloriously. And that means, and the church is Jew and Gentile. And that's important. That's not just a debating point of the church being the Israel of God. It is very, very important because when we realize our identity, that we are the new covenant people of God into whom all those prophecies are fulfilled, then we realize that we have an enormous place in God's redemptive history. The church is not just some kind of a gap a parenthesis in God's history. This is, what, this, is, this is why Jesus said, I will build my church. All of history has been moving towards this position of building the church. We realize our, our place. We realize our purpose, that we are to be declaring the greatness of God, and we do that primarily by proclaiming the gospel and making disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we also, when we realize our identity, we realize our massive potential. Several years ago, I was visiting in America, and I was at dinner with many people, and they were saying around the table, they say, they we're certainly are living in the last days. And I always behave myself in those situations. Because look at what's happening in America. And after about 10 minutes of this, I finally broke my silence. And I said, can I just say this respectfully? Do you realize America is only 1 20th of the world's population? Why do, we assume, why do you assume that because things are going bad in your country, that therefore, this must be the end of the world? 
And I began to give a little eschatological instruction. I got two converts out of it, by the way, all right? But I just began to, to say, you know, I think we underestimate, we, we, look, at, we look at all the things that, that are evil. And yes, we look at the power of Satan, but we're not looking at the power of the gospel. We're not looking at the power of Christ. Because I know places in the world where the church is thriving. We get so much tunnel vision. We look at here in South Africa and all the problems and all the literal darkness. <laughs> Maybe we should look at those times of darkness and say, you know what? It was dark in Isaiah's day. But the light shone forth. And who knows what God is up to in the dark. It's very popular in America now for preachers to be preaching sermons from Romans chapter 1 about the decline of a nation. And it has a reprobate mind. And, and I understand Romans 1. It teaches that if you shove God out of your thoughts, suppress that righteousness, verse 18 of Romans 1, then a society goes downhill. But what no one seems to understand is the context of describing the downturn of a culture. The context starts in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation, which means it can save a godless corrupt culture because Jesus Christ has all authority in heaven and in earth. Understanding, when you look at Israel in the Old Covenant, the reason that she had her demise was she lost sight of her identity. She took it for granted. She actually became arrogant at one point about it. We as the church of Jesus Christ, our identity is all these things you can read them for yourself again. We're a spiritual house. We're a spiritual priesthood. We're a holy nation. We're a chosen race. A royal priesthood. We're God's unique possession. That's a pretty good identity. That should humble us. And that should draw us to him. That should make us say, I want to continually come to him. Because I want him to use my spiritual sacrifices that I offer up to him to build his church. For his honor and glory, because I want to be a part of something that proclaims his excellencies. Brothers and sisters, we are a holy community. We are a different community by the grace of God. Don't forget the identity. Embrace it. Rejoice in it. And live it out to the glory of our great God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you for your excellencies. We praise you for your justice, for your wrath, for your grace, for your mercy, for your long-suffering, for your wisdom that we see in the gospel of your Son. Thank you for your grace in making us your people. Please, Holy Spirit, drive into our hearts this glorious identity. And may we ever grow in our appreciation of it and our living out of its implications. We pray all these things for Jesus' sake. Amen.